Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. And today, uh, I'm going to just jump right into the show because we have as our guest, Dr. Surfer Dude, Peter Kraft from Boston College, professor of philosophy, author of well over 70 books, specifically two or three or four on surfing. Professor Kraft, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. It is just so great to talk to you. Uh, how's the surf up there? Is it pretty cold? Are you in Boston today? I'm in Boston. It's pretty cold. Uh, I'm not a heroic surfer, dude. I only have a, a, a thin wetsuit for, for spring and fall, not a thick one for winter. That's the way I am, too. I hate wearing a wetsuit. Just hate it. But I'm, I'm in... Uh, well, you I'm, know, surfer, surfer's ear is very painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in Cocoa Beach, Florida right now. I spent I'm next winter I'll be spending it in Hawaii, but I'm here this for the rest of this winter and it's brutal on me. I can you know, it's cold. It's, I'm not man enough for it. You know, you must know the poll about surfers here. Uh something like 200 surfers were asked the question, if you knew you would get surfers here uh and need this painful operation, but you also knew that you would get the world's greatest wave, what would you choose? Something like 95% said give me the wave. Oh, uh, absolutely. There's a lot I know. <laughs> it's you know, I I have a uh, we we were down at the Sebastian Inlet, you know that famous surf spot, the home oh, yeah. of, the home of Shark Cali. Alley. Yeah, oh Man, yep. it is. It is too. In fact, Florida's the sharkiest place I, I, I've ever been in my life. In Hawaii, you can see the sharks. They're 100 feet down. They see you. They know you're not. They know you're not on the food chain. But here, they bump you, and you feel. I'm glad I'm a stand. I, I, <laughs> you body surf. You know. Well, you're, they say that's true of Cape Town too. South but you, Africa. That's supposed to be even worse. Yeah, I saw that live where uh, the surfer was competing and got hit by that shark. And you know what was so cool, Professor Crafters, when that happened, the other competitor in the water just took off after him to save him. He didn't, you know, just didn't hesitate to go, go right in the face of that, 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 that shark mm -hmm. and, and save his buddy. But when you, you, your love for um, surfing uh, is the same as the way I started out and just love. There's a special something about body surfing, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, it's pure, it's simple. Anybody can do it, little kids. I'm, I'm, I'm still a little kid. I don't know what I'm, I should be when I grow up yet. I'm only 80. <laughs> and But isn't it true that you're like, you're part of the wave. You don't, you're not riding on it, you're in it. Right, right. And right. you know... Uh, I, I once I once almost lost my life because of that. I was so convinced that I had become the ocean that uh, I let the riptides carry me wherever they wanted because the ocean is one thing that cannot possibly dream, uh, drown in the ocean. So I lost all fear. And then you found out what? Well, one of them dumped me on the beach and said, hey, you idiot, get the ego back in gear. We, I think every surfer's had that moment of realization that they're, no, that they're not invincible. Yeah. The ocean can keep us humble. Well, that way the ocean is like God. Well, you've written a few books uh, on surfing and uh, and uh, I think uh, surfing in the Lord. What are the what are the few things that uh, you we lessons we can learn from you or from the ocean? Well, that there's something much greater than yourself that you can't control, and if you try to control it, you'll wipe out, and if you let yourself be carried by it, you'll have ecstasy, a kind of mystical experience. It's really true, and every surfer loves the, every surfer. Our real desire is to get into a big enough wave where we can be inside the barrel and just kind of get locked in. There's kind of that moment of stillness. Well, that, that, uh, that's in us because God designed us uh, to surf on him eternally, so he gave us this little image down here to, to be an appetizer. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's, it's something. When you're, when you're in the barrel, it's as if you're living in the, like time st stands still. You don't feel like you're going forward yeah. or back, or you're just in that moment, and you're not thinking about the next bill you have to pay or the next class you're going to teach or the next. You're just living totally in that in that moment of now, which is where God lives. You know. And I think that's very profound because most people think of heaven as a different kind of place, but I think more importantly is that it's a different kind of time. The one thing I'm certain of is not in heaven is clocks. <laughs> I know you know and that 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 throws me back to I know one of your favorite people in the world, Augustine. I remember the first time I read his confessions, 
and he's going off on this conversation about time. Uh, but really, it's quite critical yep. because it, to understand time gives us a, a much clearer understanding of, of who God is. You know? Well, that moment of Augustine's conversion in the garden was instantaneous. In that instant, when God entered into his soul, uh, all of time stops, and the whole history of Western civilization changes. How long did it take? No time at all. And you look at the—I was thinking this morning, I, I teach every morning, uh, Professor Cray, from my balcony— with the ocean rising in the back, the sun rising over the ocean in the background, and today we're talking about the Eucharist and that cosmic now of Christ on the cross. You know when we're made present there through the Eucharist, and how Jesus' name is I am who am salvation. I'm Yeshua. I'm Joshua. Translate that from the Hebrew into the into the Aramaic, into the Greek, into the English. I don't know how it gets there, but uh, mm -hmm. you know the contraction of Yahweh. I am who am Shua. I am who am salvation. Jesus is the I am who am. Yeah, yeah, it's all in there. It's like the Eucharist, it's a round circle. Everything is inside that circle. And there's the tube we're talking about, In fact, right? when you see a sunset, when you see the sun going down into the sea, it's even more perfectly Eucharistic because it's red. That's the color of blood. You know, there's a, there's a place I wrote about in my, my book, Deep in the Wave, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. There's a place, and you know very well where it is. It's Waimea Bay, a place of huge... Oh, yeah. It only breaks when it's huge. But Waimea means uh, red water. Because the, the river that empties wow. out brings red water there. And there's just this whole, I had this whole thing where I had, I had this, this thing. I have never published it, but it's where uh, 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 this guy wants to paddle out. And these people show up, and it's Augustine and Aquinas and John of the Cross. And, yeah, and they had this conversation about why I'm And John of, the Cross has this, John of the Cross has this big tattoo, this big, huge Crusaders-type tattoo on his back. And it's just, yeah, someday i got to publish that. <laughs> thing but why am i oh i gotta read that <laughs> yeah but get, that sounds like a foretaste of heaven yeah i know and you know they're with us right now it is true when you sit at why am bay before you paddle out or you sit on i sit on my lanai and i'm reading augustine like he's there with me you know we really do have communion yeah. with the saints when it gets too well, hard to read it's fascinating yeah. because at, at the moment of my conversion to Catholicism, I had a kind of vision. It wasn't surfing, but it was water. It was Noah's Ark, and it was floating on the water, and everybody else was drowning. And there was Augustine and Aquinas and St. John of the Cross and everybody else on the Ark saying, uh, Craig, get out of that little lifeboat and come aboard the Ark. Yeah, why That's not? The action is. You know, it reminds me of my son Jeremiah. Yeah. He, he was uh, kind of floundering, didn't, didn't have a direction in life. Now he's, he's doing amazing, but... He said, I'm going to join the Coast Guard. And then, and then a big hurricane came. Or he saw that film, The Perfect Storm. He said, no, I'm going to get in the yeah. bigger boat. He joined the Navy and got on the aircraft carrier. So, yeah. the ark of the <laughs> Like the line from Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> the, ark, the bark of Peter, you know, it's a pretty big boat, and it's pretty stable. And, I, you know, I love reading church history. Of, of course, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of smelly animals aboard, and you've got to clean up a lot of poop, but it's the, where the action is. Hey, speak for yourself. But yeah, exactly what I do. <laughs> well, you know, I've read I've read the history. Uh, I, I love reading Warren Carroll, and I love reading the history of the church. And when you read it, it's pretty gnarly because a lot of the popes and everybody they were like not the best people in the world. But he made the statement that we got the biggest saints and the biggest sinners. Yeah, we did. We did. But but he was making the statement that when you look at a, a, a beautiful diamond in a, in a setting, even if the setting is nothing special, the diamond is. Even if a priest raises the host. And is is a, is a sinful yeah. man. That diamond yeah. that he's raising is is beautiful. And you know when Jesus right. said, "I've prayed that your faith would not fail you." When you read the history of the church, how did we survive? But but the Holy Spirit has never never left the well, Catholic that's church. Well, that could work either way. When when you see the great sinners, I mean, you see that even some of the Renaissance folks were horrible sinners. Uh, you can say, "Oh, I'm I'm out of here." Or you can say the opposite. You can say any institution manned by idiots like that couldn't possibly last for more than than two days. This has lasted for two millennia. That's There's exactly be God behind it. That's the exact way that I look at it. We're talking with Professor Peter Kraft, and you know, so cool. Your name is such an awesome name. Peter is such an awesome name. And we were just in the Holy Lands two weeks ago. And right well, there. Well, you know, Kraft also is a water word. Kraft no. means lobster. So Peter Kraft <laughs> means rock lobster. So I'm edible. <laughs> but it is true. You are because, 
you're able to take, oh, Thomas Aquinas. You, I know, there, you've written so many books. And one of the things I like to avail myself to is on Amazon, there's that series. I think it's an audible of the Modern Scholar series. You have the one on Thomas Aquinas, which I've listened to you know, constantly when I'm walking on the beach. You've got one about the, the history of philosophy that people can easily avail themselves to. And you, and you do make it chewable because when we listen and read your books, you take these most uh, complex things and make them something you and I, anyone can listen to. We're talking with Dr. Peter Crave. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. We're getting just a little bit of sound on your of your breathing uh, coming across your cell phone. So try. Oh, okay. So, Let me change the phone a little bit. Yeah. So don't breathe anymore. Um, <laughs> how do I talk without breathing? Well, I can let my stomach rumble. <laughs> okay, we're going to start up again. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My adventure guide, my co-adventure guide today is Doctor. Peter Kraft, he's written over 70 books. Uh, he's, uh, oh my gosh, his YouTube videos, I listen to them constantly. And uh, so many great ones. And uh, most profoundly, he's, uh, he's a body surfer. He loves, he loves the ocean. He gets it. Uh, welcome back to the show, uh, Dr. Kraft. So I got, Thank you for having me there. Oh, man. You know, this has got to be the most fun show you get to do because we get to talk about surfing. So I got a question for you. I'm going to dedicate this show to one of my the best friends that I have in the world. <clears throat> this man I towed my son into 80-foot surf in 2007, the biggest surf ever ridden uh, that they say in Oahu. Uh, the Coast Guard actually said it was 100-foot surf, but in Hawaii you cut things down. Crazy Todd is his name. He towed my son Jeremiah in. It's on film, highly pixelated, because the people who were filming it were nowhere near. You know, Jeremiah was over a mile and a half out to sea. He rode it for a mile and a quarter before he could kick out. He rode 10 waves. One time he was so barreled that you could, he didn't even know he was in the barrel. The wave was so big. It was so ominous. His name is Crazy wow. Todd. He's a big wave rider. People call him a uh, big wave rider. And uh, this is a man who uh, one day uh, saw, uh, heard a, a young girl, like a young two or three-year-old child crying under an overpass. He went down and inspected and brought her to the authorities and said, I want to adopt this girl because his mother was, the mother was a coke addict. Um, he's, he's just a beautiful, beautiful man. He has a beautiful child and wife. He's, he's, he snorkel dives 80 feet down, 60 feet down, and, and, and spear fishes. He's an all-around waterman and a dear friend. But my dear friend was raised on the Big Island, and he was raised by a mother and father who were very fundamentalist. Uh, he was taught that the year, the the the, the universe is 6,000 years old, that uh, he only was allowed to read the Bible and learned all of his math from the Bible and, and kind of came out of that situation. It was almost like a little hippie commune, I guess, on the Big Island. In fact, his house was eaten up by the volcano. Uh, and so Crazy Todd is uh, the most evangelistic atheist that I know. Yet he's one of the most vi virtuous... Yes, but he's one of the most virtuous men. If he's a surfer, he won't be an atheist for long. Well, I tell you, I, I agree with you, but, uh, uh, you know, he's getting long in the tooth now, and, uh, but he's one of the most virtuous men I know. But he's, he has this, uh, he's very evangelistic in his angst towards God, and it has to do usually with something. But, uh, so let's dedicate this to Crazy Todd, and I want to ask you okay. uh, the questions every atheist asks. Um, I think one of the big questions he has is, uh, I if I can't see it, in, I don't I don't want to believe in anything I can't see under a microscope. Uh, so he's I guess. Oh, then he better not believe in himself. <laughs> so go for it. Let... Because how how big is the self, and what color is it, and what shape is it, and and can you see the self in a microscope? You know you can't because you're looking at it. The one thing you can't ever see in a microscope is the one who's looking at it. Wow. And then you, and then you think that's about like, that's like the one thing you can't ever put an image of on the movie screen is the projector. That's the source of the light that's behind all the images. And you think so about if 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 he believes that he's, he he can't believe in anything that he can't see, he can't believe that he exists. There's just those molecules in his brain. That's all. There's nobody behind it. It's like a computer without a programmer. I mean, the human person is the only 
being. I mean, a dog is aware of itself, but it's not aware that it's aware of itself. But we as humans are. We're not only right. Aware. There's something transcendent about our nature. Right. That's why we can feel this moral experience of, 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 of good and evil, and animals can't. When, when, when a dog pees on the, on the floor, you don't reason with it and call him a sinner and tell him to go to confession. You just train him. Well, you know, the, the thing about what I'm going to, I could go that direction. I'm going to go into the problem with evil in a moment. But what are the, is there other proofs other than scientific proofs for the existence of God? I mean, is it only if it's, you know, in the, you only can look at the material world, or where would you go with that? Well, I don't think there are any strictly scientific proofs for the existence of God, because science only deals with visible phenomena, and God is not a visible phenomenon. But there's very good philosophical proofs of the existence of God. And some of them come from nature. All the design in nature couldn't possibly have happened without an intelligence. And all the power in nature must be uh, derived from a single source. There's got to be a big banger behind the Big Bang. But those are not scientific proofs. They don't show up in, in a laboratory. They show up in your mind. Well, do, are, do abstract numbers uh, exist, for example? I mean, can you look at, can you look at the wall? That's a tough one. Can you look at the wall and see an abstract number, or is that something that is beyond the material world? Well, they, they don't exist in the material world, but they're, they exist outside your mind because your mind has to conform to them. Your mind has no control over the fact that two and three make five, but your mind does have a control over where the dominoes land or what kind of a house you build. So numbers aren't things in the world, and yet they're not just opinions in your mind because opinions can be wrong. And you put your opinions by objective truth. So numbers are an example of an objective truth that's not just material. Well, one of the things, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the, the five proofs for the existence of God, other than the sixth one, which you and I both know about, you know, uh, God, there's a surfing, therefore God exists. Can mm -hmm. you, uh, there's a, can you, you, music, musicals do it too. I know, I know three people who, who were, were once atheists and they were converted by the music of Bach. Their favorite you, argument is there is the music of Bach, therefore there must be a God. And you personally, I think one of your first kind of wake up calls, at least at Catholicism, was the beauty of a cathedral. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how could beauty and truth be so contradictory to each other that the the wickedest institution in the world, Roman Catholic Church, produced the most beautiful buildings in history, Gothic cathedrals. That doesn't make sense. And to me, uh, Professor Craved, I crave truth. I want I mean I to me truth is beautiful. Truth is beautiful. Can you uh, can you punch the ticket on a on just a couple of the Aquinas' proofs uh you know uh for us? Uh, in other words, just give you a summary. Yeah, if you could. I, know, I mean, if you, if you could do that. All right, let's, yeah. let, let's take the simplest one. The simplest one is proof number two. It's called the proof from efficient causality. Efficient causality means one thing gives existence to another thing. Uh, parents make children. Children make uh, drawings. Uh, drawings are not created. They don't make anything. But one thing brings something else into existence. So existence is like a, a gift passed down a long, long chain. Uh, okay. If existence is a gift and the receiver is dependent on the giver, uh, contingent, uh, then the whole universe is that very, very long large complex chain so if there's nothing that has existence and doesn't have to get it then there's no first cause there's no uncaused cause in that case there's no reason for the whole universe suppose you see a a, a large iron ring uh, that's not falling to the ground uh, hanging up in the middle of the air you don't say oh well that's what rings do you say, no, there must be a reason why that ring is hanging up in the air. And then you look up another foot and you see another ring holding it. And you look up another foot and you see a third ring holding it. And there's a great big chain. And you say, oh, well, that's why it's there, because each link is holding another link up. But why is the whole chain there? Uh, unless somebody's holding the first link, unless somebody's perched on top of a, of a tall building, let's say, uh, and holding the whole chain, 
uh, the whole chain doesn't exist. Well, existence itself is like that chain. So there must be some being that exists eternally and doesn't need to depend on anything else to get it from, uh, from that something else. And that's one of the attributes of God. I mean, that's not yet a proof of a personal God, but it's enough to refute atheism. Yeah, it may make you a theist, but there, you can't be a polytheist because behind polytheism there has to be that one ultimate right. cause. And God is both right. ex, God is both existence and essence. And you can't you can't give something you don't have, and you can't exactly. you can't be something bigger. You can't have more power than what power has been transmitted to you. We're talking with. Dr. Peter Crave. Well, according according to the man whose reputation is the most intelligent man in the world, you can. Stephen Hawking once asked uh, why there is a Big Bang and there's no Big Banger. He's an atheist. He says, well, universes just happen. I, I would like to meet uh, Stephen Hawking someday. I have a timeshare in Florida. I'd like to sell him. <laughs> we're talking with... We're or talk maybe the Brooklyn Bridge. We're ta well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of swamp land here, too. We're talking with Dr. Peter Kreeft. Uh, he's the professor at Boston College. He's one of the one of the, one of the most beautiful minds I've ever been around. I love to listen to his talks and uh, on YouTube, and I and I watch him. I read his books, and uh, it's such a privilege. But the coolest thing about him is he's a surfer dude. He uh, he, he really uh, you really come to a place of a humility and wonder when you surf a wave. We want to invite you guys to go to our website, deepadventure.com. You can join the Bears Man Cave, but only if you're a man, and you get access to our private Facebook group, and you get to do every couple of weeks or so we have a, a meetup, a video chat meetup, and you can join us there. We talk story, look at how ugly we are at each other, and, uh, and we're going through the virtues right now. We'll be right back, we'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're talking with uh, a returning guest, Dr. Peter Kreeft, uh, surfer dude, loves to surf, changes your whole life when you surf. I love to teach people how to surf because they come out of the water after riding that first wave, and I know I've ruined their life forever. So uh, we're, glad to have, <laughs> we're glad to have Dr. Kreeft with us. Aloha, Dr. Kreeft. Aloha to you, Bear. Yeah, we got to surf together one of these days. Right? I didn't know bears surfed. Well, I knew you know, dogs surf. I didn't know bears surf. Well, you know, my my dog and I used to surf together. Kokomo and I. He loved to surf, and he had a little uh, a vest that he would wear with a handle on the back. It's just a little silky terrier. And uh, oh my gosh, when I would get that vest out, he would go crazy, and he would hang ten. Out. He would hang. <laughs> he would hang. T he would hang ten out the nose of the board, and I'd do these bottom turns, and we'd ride these waves, but. Uh, but man, in Hawaii, there's a few other people that bring their dogs out, and there's also a pig. And when they come out, he get all territorial on them, you know. But he he was my <laughs> surfing dog. But that's how I got my nickname, Bear. I was out. Uh, by the way, are you a martial artist too? No, no. Because in your letter, a little you, tai chi. That's all. Okay, because in your letter you said arigato, so I get, I figured, oh, maybe he knows I'm a black belt. But my 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 ninja. Visit Japan. Know a couple of Japanese words. That's okay. All. Well, yeah, well, you know sushi words probably. But uh, yeah, so I, I was I was out teaching my my sensei, uh, and I was I was privileged, by the way, to to uh, to have uh, as one of my senseis, Master Hayes, the first white ninja. And uh, one, but my teacher was out, and we, I was teaching him how to surf, and I had that big old ugly beard. I'm not going to admit to having a mullet, and uh, and he surfs by me. I'm just teaching him how to surf. And by the way, they would only surf for 55 minutes, the length of a martial arts class, but. But he said, I never saw a bear surf before. And so from then on, in the, you know, we had a fairly big dojo, and I was an instructor there. And so from then on, he called me Bear Song. And then later, my, my nickname was changed to the Bear. And then when I started getting checks, uh, like surf contests and stuff, to Bear, because that was my, became my competition name, I couldn't cash him. So I, I added it to my legal name. So you're right. That's, that's where bears do surf. At least one. Yeah, at least one of, one of us do. Oh, well, there was another guy. There was this place in uh, the San Fernando Valley. I forget the name of it now, but it was a biker surfer bar. And uh, there was another guy there named Bear, and he and I was getting in trouble. And then I would show up, and they go, man, I heard you, I heard you really got in big trouble last week. And so I get blamed 
There's not there's not many of us, but I get blamed for all the bad bears out there. But, um, well, but, I met an Alaskan surfer once, uh, and I said, uh, uh, I guess you don't have any problem with the uh, uh, sharks up there. He said, no, we have a problem with the bears. Oh, my goodness. Did you see Christopher Stefanik's show where he's surfing in, I think, in Wisconsin on one of the Great Lakes on EWTN? No, but uh, I know they do uh, surf on Lake Superior. I met one once. Yeah, in our in our first show we had an EW10, we had a surfer from there on our show. Okay, so I want to ask wow. you now. So we're going back to my friend Crazy Todd. He towed my son into yeah. eighty foot plus surf. Jeremiah was the only one surfing that day in all of the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, there was one person, Laird Hamilton, who paddled out or try uh, on the North Shore of Maui, called it one hundred feet. The Coast Guard called it one hundred feet. But on uh, the north shore of Oahu, it was only Jeremiah. And then after he caught some waves, uh, a couple of Brazilians towed in, and Ace Cool, who we recently lost, uh, paddle, he used to like to paddle out at Waimea, which is only breaks when it's 24 foot plus. And last year, paddled out. He used to like to paddle out at night, and uh, we just never saw him again. But um, my friend Crazy Todd is this radical guy, uh, but he's the most evangelistic atheist I know. And so, Peter Craved, I'm dedicating this to my, my good friend crazy Todd. He's a, he's a dear, dear friend of mine. Last time I was in Hawaii a month ago, we go to a place called China Walls. It's a pretty sketchy place. I mean, people die there regularly. He jumps into the water with his little five-year-old girl and, and teaching her you know, how to handle the waves. And it's, The waves break along the side of this cliff. And uh, then his dog jumps in. The, the little girl grabs the dog, and the dog paddles her to the rocks and have to climb out of these rocks. He's just, he's just a wonderful man, but he's an atheist, and he has a lot of Kind of angst, I would say, <clears throat> and uh, and so I want to dedicate this to him. I need I need your help to help him understand. And That's one good. Of the well, you, you dedicate it also to the future, Crazy Todd, because uh, if he is uh, an evangelistic atheist, he's searching for the truth, and that means he's searching for God. And we have it on the highest authority that all who seek find eventually. I agree. In God's own time and in God's own way. I agree, and you know he's. But he, you know, he's the one that started me off on the journey to really study a lot about the proofs of the existence of God. And uh, he's, you know, he's into the, these knuckle draggers, uh, uh, Dawkins and Hitchens and the, the four new brights yeah. of the, mo you know. But Nietzsche and guys like that, they're, they're pretty compelling in their languages like thunderbolts. Oh, much more so. The, the, the new atheists have nothing new at all. They're just uh, pale versions of Nietzsche and Sartre and the great old atheists who had passion. Uh, but you know the the great the great atheist representative of the last century. I think he was with C.S. Lewis and those guys at Oxford. What was his name? Anton Flew, I think it was. Anthony Flew. Anthony, Anthony Flew. Flew. Yeah, he was the one atheist. I love debates. Most people don't want want to debate. So I I once said to uh, uh, to somebody who wanted me to debate an atheist, I will debate any atheist in the world except Anthony Flew. <laughs> Anthony Flew was the most intelligent man I ever met, but he was an atheist, but not for long. Uh, he, in his 70s or 80s, uh, succumbed to the evidence and says, yes, there must be a God. It was because of the DNA molecule, I think he finally realized. Uh, the, the, yeah. uh, it, yeah. but, but, you know, but, but, you know, Hitchens and Dawkins say he just became senile. <laughs> but I think you're right. Anybody who seeks truth. But one of the questions he asked me is this, these four things. You know, God is all powerful. God is all good. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about? One of those cannot... Uh, yeah, what was what was it? He asked me. I forgot the exact way he phrased well, it. Well, the strongest the strongest argument for atheism is certainly that argument, the argument for evil. Uh, if God is all powerful, He can do anything. If He's all good, He wants only good. And if He's all wise, He knows exactly how to get what He wants. And therefore, if there's a God, there couldn't be any evil. And there is evil. Therefore, there's no God. Uh, the only answer to that argument is that God is so wise, much wiser than we are, that he sees that to allow evil by giving man free will would be even better than to make us happy robots. And we don't see that, at least not in this life, but we can believe it. It's consistent. It makes sense. Without free will. I mean, yeah, God, uh, could, God could stop all of the, all that, any, any, any evil or in the world just by just yeah, by he, take, he could even he, he could even make he could even make human beings who weren't able to do anything wrong because whenever we uh shot somebody he turned the bullet to butter 
And whenever we got an evil thought, he'd give us a frontal lobotomy and destroy the evil thought. But of course, then we wouldn't be truly human. We'd be just happy robots. It's the price you pay for love. You know, love has to be freely given. It's it's like having children. If you have children, you know there's going to be tragedies, and they're going to goof up, and they're going to break your heart. Uh, But it's still a wonderful thing to do, and the good outweighs the evil. And you don't want to have just pets who can't sin, but children who can, because they're like you. In the adventure of our life on Earth is actually so short, and then there's eternity. And the price we pay here, um, you know, the thing is, is when we die, you know, death, judgment, heaven or hell, many of us will go through purgatory. And I just, that's just that process. You can begin it here on Earth. But I, I used to have this sense that when I died, because I didn't know there was a purgatory, it was a presto changeo. Now I'm perfect. I have a great attitude. I love God. I want to do His will. The reality is that even even after our death, we go through this burning of just learning to love God, seeing God face to face. The love in us just burns away our own agendas, burns away our selfish will. And, and we want that. And we, that's what we want with all our heart. That's why purgatory is more happy than it's sad. Yes, it's painful, but we want the pain because we see where we're going. Is it was a Catherine of Siena that had the vision. I remember which saint it was, but that vision of the burning. Yep. Yep. It's not. It's not like hell. It's. It's a. To me, I see it as eros. I, I desire God. I just yep. want to be with you. And, and and this great pain of love just burns away my selfishness. But it's a will. I'm willing fact, to let it in burn. Fact, in, in, in those dialogues in Purgatory, God shows her. Uh, the pains of purgatory, which were greater than the pains of earth, and the joys of purgatory, which were far greater than the joys of earth. And she said, the, the greatness of the joys is greater than the greatness of the pain. And there, But th- th- there is this choice I'm making as I'm seeing God face to face. Oh, I love you, God. I desire you, God. She says, you're feeling this pain, but you're, 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 you're bliss. You're, you're, you're seeing him. Uh, you ignore all that. It's so worth it. But there is this willing transformation that we go through in purgatory of abandoning our, our agendas, abandoning our pride, abandoning us, our selfishness, and abandoning ourselves to God's will. Even after you know, we make a choice here on earth, it's an active, continuous journey with the Lord of, of, uh, of, of, of this life of virtue. But even in heaven, it's not like we die and boom, all of a sudden we're perfect. Even there, he, he, he takes us through that process of letting us let go and really be abandoned to his will. And to be abandoned to his will is the same thing as being abandoned to his love because God is love. We're talking with Dr. Yep. the surfer dude, Dr. Peter Kraft. This is Bear Wozniak on the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My producer tells me I have to tell you guys to go to my, our website, deepadventure.com. It's where you can uh, get our newsletter, which means if you get it, you get this radio show emailed to you uh, in, a, in a podcast or an MP3 format. So you get to listen to it before it airs on EWTN Network and uh, listen to whatever you want to. But the cool thing, you guys, is we are evangelists. Our ministry is evangelistic. And that means we have to work outside the box. We can't just preach to the choir. When you get this email, you can share it with your friends. That person that you wished you could reach, I can't think of a better show than the one we're doing right now with Dr. Craved. This is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Okay, Dr. Kraft, I got a question for you. I think we've done two segments. Or have we done three? I think we've done three. I can't even remember. Three. <laughs> we've done how many? Yeah, we're not very good at higher math. <laughs> <laughs> have we done two or three? I can't even remember. I just get lost. Three. In okay, that's what I thought. Okay, good. Now I'm going to throw you the doozy. Okay, so we'll give it a, about a 10-second pause, and then we'll start. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure, where we uh, seek to bring you on the adventure. We believe that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wildness of God's will. And God's wild. Uh, Wilderness is wild. Quasars are wild. Uh, You know, black holes, don't mess with them. The God of the universe is is as close to you as your next breath. And you you may die. Many people I know, when I go speak at men's conferences, when I have my radio show, I know there's a good chance there's, that there's several listeners that will die before the next show. And I take it, I take it as serious as a heart attack, uh, what we do here. Uh, but for those who do die, and they die in Christ, the wonder of it uh, is, is amazing. We're talking with Dr. 
Peter Kraft, who's a surfer. That's the only reason he even comes on my show, and so we can talk about surfing. But today we're tackling, I think, I think the hardest question in every religion. If you're going to be a good religion, you've got to be able to answer the question of why there's suffering, why there's pain. And it's kind of relatively uh, makes common sense, the, the argument that God gives us a free will, because without that, how can we freely choose love? It's the price you pay for love. But Dr. Kraft, what about natural evil? What about uh, the mudslides uh, we recently had, the fires, the hurricanes? What about these sort of things? How do you, how do you deal with that in the, in the face of a loving God? The problem, the moral problem there, uh, obviously, is a physical problem. Pain hurts, but there's a moral problem. Isn't it unjust for good people to to suffer? Uh, and we don't suffer what we deserve. Sometimes bad people get an easy life, and sometimes good people get a hard life. So how do we got to explain that? How is that just? The answer to that, to that question is in the Book of Job, where Job is this really good man who has this terrible life and he can't understand it, and the three friends have to figure it out, and they say, well, you must be a sinner. That's the only thing that makes sense. And when God finally shows up and gives Job his answer, he doesn't explain himself. He doesn't say, well, see, I'm, I'm, I'm proper, and I'm nice, and I follow your laws, and this is really just after all. He talks about wild things like behemoth and leviathan, and these monsters of the deep. And he says, where were you, Job, when I uh, designed the world? I didn't notice that you were there advising me. So it remains a mystery. That's, that's what makes it an adventure. If we could figure it all out, it wouldn't be a mystery, it wouldn't be an adventure, and life would be a formula. And he, so the answer to the question, why do the righteous suffer, is we don't know. God does, and we're not God. And you know, and even in heaven, we're not going to know it all. We're going to see God. We're not going to comprehend. Yeah, we're would, still only humans. Uh, you know? God, God is infinite. Even though we're deeply united with God, we remain finite. So there's a, a new truth about God every minute that we discover. We're never bored. And the thing about it is, when you look at when you look at this this experience in the world of this adversity, uh, when Jesus, when when G, when, they, when the universe was created in those six days of work, and it says God rested. And then Jesus came in the work of salvation. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he rested in the grave and then rose again. God is still working. He works all things together for the good. God is still working. And all these things that we look at, the adversity in our lives and the challenges and the surprises, the unexpected, the mother Angelica being miraculously healed in her youth, and then being miraculously healed later on, and then going into a time of years of not being able to be, of being an invalid. Why, Lord? Why, Lord? These surprises of adversity, even among the most holy people in the world, God is at work. All things work together for the good. God is still at work in our lives, isn't he? Yes, and if we understood that before the end, there wouldn't be a story. There wouldn't be an adventure. So the fact that life is a great mystery makes it worth living and worth pursuing. Uh, you don't pursue a formula. Once you know a formula, there it is. Two plus two equals four, nothing more to know. Life's not like that. Life's an adventure. I know as a CPA, I always say there's the brain part of my work. And I'm like, oh, I figured it out. I don't want to finish it. I don't want to cross the T's and dots the I's. That puzzle's over. So I want to go to the next one. Let me ask you this question. As a surfer, you know you love the adventure. An adventure is only an adventure if there's risk. There's only a, the key yep. part of adventure is adversity. What will be our adventure in heaven? Ch Chesterton says. Chesterton says an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly construed. Well, what, an inconvenience is only an adventure wrongly construed. It's just it's it's the de it's the, the the departure from the norm. Well, what will be our adventure yep. in heaven? Do you see us? Having uh, challenges and, and, and adventure, I, I hope so. I hope there's still it isn't just certainly this, yeah. What certainly, we'll, we'll, in fact, it's more than, than than that. Here, when you surf on an eighty foot wave, it's like uh, David meeting Goliath. But God is infinitely greater than a, than an eighty foot wave, and we're going to surf on God forever. So this is a surprise every moment. Will we live in a linear time and space? Do you think, or will we? You know, God is lives in the eternal now, but our, our existence will still be somehow linear. 
You know, there will still be. I still I want don't to be. Think, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I think there's progress in this movement. We're not we're not frozen. We're not static, but it's not this kind of time. Mm. Uh, even now, we live in two kinds of time. Material time is, is linear, and one moment of time is just an hour, and then there's the next hour. But what you experience in those hours are so different that that's spiritual time. There's two Greek words for that, chronos and kairos. So I think heaven will be the perfection of spiritual time without the limitation of material time. It's going I, I, it's to be cool. And I mean, I'm saying that because I believe uh, that, uh, that I'm going to be there. I'm, I'm working, working to, move in, to live in virtue, abandon myself to God's will, but more than anything, to just fall madly, just fall madly in, in, in love with Jesus. And I look forward to seeing him. Can you tell me about your personal prayer life, what your, what your normal uh, journey is through the week as you uh, seek to go deeper with God? That's too dull. I don't think people want to hear dull <laughs> things. Let's, let's talk about God rather than me. I think I, I, I challenge people, especially the men listening, uh, to spend an hour every day uh, with the Lord. And it may be praying the Liturgy of the Hours. Oh, that's an adventure. Yeah. Because that's a, the reason why I ask when you that. Prayer, prayer, prayer is like prayer is like getting into water over your head. Yeah, it's a, a surfer understands prayer. It's a, it's a, it's you know so, you know we paddle out and we wait. And I remember one summer I paddled out every day all summer and I got like ankle slappers, you know, and that's it. But the whole key to prayer is we paddle out. Surfers per, surfers in the summer that you know they want to go out every single day. But then you wait on the Lord. You turn your back on the Aina, and you wait on the Lord. Uh, but for me, um, that's what they're you're... like. They're, uh, the shepherds are like dogs. When you come home to your dog, he's been waiting for you all day, and then when you open the door, he's, he's so excited. And so, well, we're the dog, and God's gonna open the door at death. Yeah, and we just want. So I challenge men, especially, uh, to spend that time with the Lord, because men men want to work. They want to be productive. But the time you spend in prayer is the mo most productive time you can have uh, during the day. The liturgy of the hour, the work of the people, it's the most productive thing that you can do in life. Okay, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to throw one more thing at you, Professor Crave, because we've got to go in a few minutes. Tell my friend Crazy Todd how much God loves him and uh, anything you can else the Lord puts on your heart. Well, tell him that even though he doesn't believe in God, God believes in him. And uh, man, that's going to win. He's, he's not going to win that fight against God. Nobody ever did. God's going to have his way. It's probably guaranteed. Uh, but the way he does it, the way God does it is always surprising. And God's not a, a, a train. He's a lover, so he doesn't go by a timetable. He's, he's what did you say? God is not what? God is a lover, not a train. A train runs by a timetable, and you can predict when the train is going to show up. But you can't do that to a lover. A lover surprises you. Oh, uh, and all in, on, and and the love is patient. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I know uh, friends that are on their way to becoming Catholic, and it's just so interesting to me because I'll talk to the, introduce them to the ca a Catholic priest or someone, and he'll say, just, just all in God's timing, all in God's timing. You know, very, wa very, very wise uh, of them too. Because I'm an evangelist. I want it now. You know, I'm fired up. I want people to come to the Lord now. <laughs> The prayer for patience. God give you patience immediately. Yeah, and rely on the Lord that it's it's his it's his work. Well, we're talking with Crazy Todd, but but we're really talking to everybody out there who has this kind of lingering uh, feeling, and they've been fed a lot of poisonous type lies and misinformation, a lot of angst. It's kind of the cool thing now to be an atheist, but uh, God loves you, and God God uh, I mean God really loves you. When a surfer rides in the barrel, or rides a big wave. There's a sense of exhilaration. There's nothing more exhilarating than those moments of bliss that come into our lives. As God, sometimes you get that sense that God is gazing at you. But our, our life is just meant to love God back with the love that he's give, given us and to someday see him face to face. There can't be any greater um, adventure than that. We're talking with Dr. Peter Crave. Can people find you someplace on the Internet? I mean, I know YouTube, you're, I mean, you're everywhere, but is there any? Any place in particular you send people to for your books? Uh, I've got a website, petergrave.com. I never 
uh, visit my website because my relationship to computers is like the relationship of matter to antimatter. We both explode when we touch, yeah. but I've got a, a webmaster who's good at it. Yeah, it's like you, like me. I never listen to my radio shows either or watch my TV shows. It just bugs me too much. Anyway, we're talking with Peter, Peter Crave, Dr. Crave, one of my favorite people in the world. I've learned so much from him. Uh, we want to invite you, too, to go to our website, deepadventure.com. My books are there. We've got all kinds of motorcycle pins and patches and stuff like that from our Long Ride Home TV series, reality show on motorcycles. And uh, we have DVDs you can send to that brother-in-law or son that you know just won't watch anything that's too religious, but they'll watch this because everybody w loves Jesus and motorcycles. Um, thank you for joining us, Dr. Crave. You're very welcome. God bless. Okay, until, next, until next week, Viva Cristo Rey. I'm going to tell my son, Shane, oh, i got to do something here, doctor, before I lose this whole thing. Magically push the stop streaming button.